dance, jump, run. Do whatever you want to do. Magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless be the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. good in the house of the Lord tonight. Sure seems like a bunch of you came to church ready to worship God. Praise God. You know that always makes a better service, don't you? Always makes a better service when we show up to worship the Lord. Praise God. Not only does it make a better service, it's going to bless you because you don't enter into the presence of the Lord without getting all the benefits that goes with being in the presence of the Lord. I like I like what I feel in the house of God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We've had a great Sunday today, a great crowd here tonight. Thankful for that. God bless all of you for being here. When I announced this morning what I was going to preach tonight, I got to thinking probably half of you wouldn't come back. But I think everybody's back here, and we're glad to see you in the house of the Lord this evening. God bless you. This Sunday, we had a total this morning of 955 people in our services. Praise God. I'm going to stand here before long and tell you, guess what? We went over a 1,000 today. Won't be long. Praise God. We're estimating that there were 500 in here. It's the only one of the services that we're estimating, 100 over in the kids' service, 110 at CLC, 105 in our Spanish 110 at Nova and 30 at Danville, 955 people in church today. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. My subject tonight is a 2023 message on separation. A 2023 message on Separation. Everybody said separation. separation. Talking about separation from the world. Separation from a carnal, ungodly, immoral, anti-God generation. First John chapter 2 and verse number 15. If you've got your Bible, share with us. If you don't, then it's uh, going to be on the screen. There may be people around you that you want to let look on your Bible with you if there's actually Bibles here. I'm thinking if you don't take your Bible to church, it don't go nowhere. I'm assuming you're not taking it to Walmart. Amen? Ought to bring our Bibles to the house of the Lord. Could I get a good hearty amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's already being ornery. Praise God. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Would you read that out loud with me? Let's all read together. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's go backwards in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17. It says, Wherefore come out. 
from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Why don't we read that one out loud as well together. Let's all read. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God bless you. You may be seated. When I announce my title, a 2023 message on separation, it could be that there were several people in this room that at the same time had the thought, what is a 2023 message on separation? It is a message on separation that is relevant to life in 2023. I grew up in a church that preached separation and holiness different than it's preached today. There are many things that the scripture teaches that we ought to do and the scripture never changes. Hello? The scripture never changes. There are specifics in the word of God, specific directions in the word of God that come under the heading of holiness and separation. And those things that were good when they were written nearly two millennia ago were good one millennia ago. They were good a hundred years ago. They were good ten years ago. And they're good today. If it's clearly spelled out in the scripture. But the scripture has always given the church and the shepherd a little bit of leeway in setting standards for the church. I grew up in the hippie generation. In the 19, I was born in 1957 and was in school in the 1960s, and I was very much alive and well in the hippie generation. And I watched how the hippies allowed their, the guys to allow their hair to grow long. Before the hippie generation, that was very uh, out of ordinary for a man to have long hair. And I remember when men began to wear beards, long beards, so on and so forth. And I remember the pastors that would get up and say, you don't need to be associated with that. You don't need to look like that. You don't need to have that tag put upon you. You don't want people to think that that's you, that you believe what the hippie generation believes and Woodstock and all those things that are associated with the hippie generation, the marijuana, the psychedelic drugs, the free sex, and on and on and on, everything. The preachers would say you don't want to be identified with that. And scripturally, they had a right to do that. But did the Bible specifically say that? No. There are things that the church taught when I was younger that was in the Bible and things that was not in the Bible. And they had a right to teach what was not in the Bible. But it would be absolutely foolish for me to say, Now, there's things in that book that don't change. A man shall not wear that which pertaineth to a woman, nor a woman wear that which pertaineth to a man. That a woman ought to have long, uncut hair, and a man ought to have his hair cut. The separation of the sexes, that strong drink is a mockery, and, a, and, and, and that a child of God should not participate in those things. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you shouldn't destroy deliberately the temple of the Holy Ghost. I don't know if you know or not but there's a place in the Bible that says you don't cut your body deliberately there's another place in the Bible that says you don't tattoo up your body deliberately so 
I had a tattoo when I come to God, then that's going to be a reminder of you of your old life. But you sure don't go out and get more once you've come to God. Those things don't change. If it's written in the scripture, it don't change. But there are things that are unique to every generation. Unique to every culture. When we go to Thailand, you'll see men over there that dress differently than we do. Women that dress differently than the women here do. You go to some of the other uh, Middle Eastern countries and it looks like both men and women have on the same tunic. It doesn't look like it's any different at all. What's men's apparel? What's ladies' apparel? It's harder to figure out. Every culture has its own unique set of circumstances. If you're understanding me, say amen. amen. I want to preach a message tonight about 2023 separation and what that entails and what that means in our day and age. Very often I talk about my pastors. I think my grandfather was the greatest pastor that ever lived. He was the greatest man of God certainly in my life. But I have been blessed to have wonderful pastors in my life. All of my pastors except Brother Stone King who is pastoring me now are going on to be with the Lord. Everyone I've ever asked to be my pastor, God has taken them home. They're not here anymore. My grandfather and my Uncle Bill obviously impacted me more than any other men in my lifetime. They were a tremendous influence on my life. But can I tell you that Though both of them were great men of God, both of them were genuinely apostolic pastors, both of them were biblically conservative, both of them were committed to old-fashioned holiness and separation. But can I go on and tell you that neither my grandpa nor my Uncle Bill, they lived... They preached, they pastored, they died without dealing with things that I've had to deal with as a pastor this week. Never one time in their ministry did they have to deal with it. Two of the greatest men of God that ever lived. Every now and then somebody will say to me, Oh, Brother Cunningham, when are we going to hear an old-fashioned holiness message? Well, if we ever go back to the hippie days, I'll preach against it. Hello? We ever go back to the horse and buggy day? I'll do like apostolics did back then and preach against cars. Did you know that when the radio came out, apostolics preached against the radio? I'm going to tell you that what they dealt with years ago they lived and they died without ever dealing with what we've got to deal with today. And if your concept of holiness is a bunch of rules and regulations that somebody set for you 40 years ago, you're probably doing a whole lot of things that displease God today, though you're keeping that 40-year-old list. The culture changes. The day changes. Time changes. Can you say amen? amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. My grandfather and Uncle Bill never even heard of cancel culture. Lived and died with ever, without ever hearing about flexitarianism. Never heard of gaslighting. Never heard of gender binary. I had no idea what that was. I looked it up. It's the belief that all people are born either a male or female. I guess God's got gender binary. Because he said he created a male and female. My grandpa and Uncle Bill never had to say one word to any church ever from a pulpit about gender-neutral bathrooms. 
Never had to say one word about microaggressions. If they're little enough that you can call them micro, why don't you just overlook them? My grandpa never had to get up and tell the church or go to a meeting where they told him, Sir, you need to wear a pronoun badge here. It's got to say he, him, they, them, she, her, whatever it is, I don't know. Anybody looks at me and can't tell I'm a man, there's something wrong with me. They never heard of safe spaces. It was before the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. They never heard the term transgenderism. They never dealt with virtue signaling. They never dealt with wokeism. By the way, that's where I got this list from, Was if you want to Google it. All the wokeism phrases, there's 85 of them on there. I don't even want, you know what? I read them all, God, hand to God. I read every one of them and read the definition of them. And I found out that some of them up here are against some of them down here. <laughs> I don't know how you can be both because this one is contrary to that one. Hello? I, there's really no reason for me to try to comment on this list of wokeisms because the truth be known, I really don't have a clue what most of them mean. Even though I read them and read the definition, I still don't know what they mean. I'm going to tell you that living for God in 2023 is no different than living for God in 50 A.D., 100 A.D., 1901 Topeka, Kansas, or in 2023, Chesapeake, Virginia. Living for God doesn't change. Pleasing God doesn't change. The Word of God doesn't change. Culture changes. Thinking changes. But God said, I am God and I change not. Clap your hands and shout yes. The same thing that inspired the early Christians to live for God through great persecution, in spite of religious challenges, in the face of unprecedented worldliness, surrounded by haters, attacked by their enemies nonstop, the same thing that inspired those early Christians to live for God is the same thing that is required for living for God in 2023. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Early Christians believed and obeyed the powerful life-changing messages found in the two verses that I read to you. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. Come ye out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. If you want to know how to live for God, do not sit around waiting on me to make you a list. Do not sit around waiting on me making up a list of do's and don'ts for you because I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you that if God's word says it, do it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If God's word says it, do it. If God's word says don't do it, then don't do it. That's how complicated my understanding of it is. And then beyond doing what it says and not doing what it says not to do, I want to add one more thing to it, and that is this. If it pleases God, it's okay. If it displeases God, it's not okay. Somebody shout yes. yes. 
Those two verses I just quoted for you are applied to Christians. They were applied to the early day church. They were applied to Azusa Street around 1900, 1907. They were, they were applied by my grandpa when I was a boy born in 1957 and got the Holy Ghost at just seven years old, 1964. And I'm telling you, those same verses apply in 2020. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, it's black and white, honey. The love of the Father is not in him. How do you know if you love the world? When we talk about Jesus coming again, secretly are you saying, oh, I hope he don't. I just got this new house. I just got this new car. I just got this new girlfriend. I just got this new boyfriend. I just had this new baby. I just got... Hello? You know, the old timers used to remind themselves in songs. We don't do it anymore. But they used to sing, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. I've got treasures laid up somewhere beyond the blue. They used to sing, in the city where the Lamb is the light. In the city where there cometh no night. I'm going to go there by and by. Oh, friend, let me tell you something today. There is nothing in this world worth missing God over. And unless, unless we learn how to shut down the voice of God. When we hear God, we ought to listen to Him. I preached to you this morning that when God spoke to Cornelius immediately, He did what God said. There needs to be an attitude among us that if I'm walking into a place and the Holy Ghost smites me and I look around and you know I maybe ought not be here, I don't just go ahead and walk on in. When I'm listening to something on the radio and I'm thinking, boy, I'm glad nobody's in the car with me. That was nasty right there. Turn the stupid thing off because you've got to please God first. Whether anybody's watching or not. Say amen, somebody. Say, preacher, it'd be easier if you made a list for us. I know that, and that's why I'm not doing it. I'm not creating a do's and don'ts list for 2023. I'm telling you that if it pleases God, do it. And if it don't please God, stop in your tracks. Clap your hands and shout yes. Christians. Everybody say Christians. It's what we're supposed to be first. Hello? It's what we're supposed to be first. Christians. To be a Christian is more than a religious discipline. It's more than a theological belief. It's more than a school of thought. It's more than a profession of individual faith. Christianity is more than a denomination. Christianity is more than a congregation. Christianity is more than simply believing in Christ. Well then preacher, what is Christianity? To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. Oh preacher, I'd, I'd rather you tell me how long my hair is supposed to be. I'd rather you'd go through my music collection and tell me what I ought to listen to and what I shouldn't. I'd rather you'd walk around my house and help me kind of get things in order. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. But I am going to preach like a house of fire to, to us every time I get a chance that every single one of us ought to do an inventory on where we live, who we run with, what we're doing when we go where we go, the places that we go that we may not ought to go. Say amen, somebody. We've got to change our thinking about living for God. Some of us have been around so long that the list has become comfortable. 
Somebody telling us to do and don't. Even if they're not thinking of everything you ought to do and don't. Just because somebody's made a list and you're living by it, you can get comfortable in that and think, my Lord, what a great Christian I am. Hello? We've got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling in the sight of God. We've got to come to the place that every one of us knows that we are pleasing God or that we're not pleasing God. And if we find that what we're doing doesn't please God, I'm advising a real quick change. Hello? What's amazing in a church like this, when I preach and make statements like that, it goes out and goes to 400 different directions here, and we all interpret it and hear it just a little bit different because one is doing something that the Holy Ghost has been pricking their heart about. Another's doing something else the Holy Ghost has been pricking their heart about. Another one is thinking things that nobody but them know about, but they know God's not pleased with it. And when you make a statement like, if it doesn't please God, stop it, it It hits 400 people 400 different ways. That's what the Bible means by work out your own salvation with fear and trembling before God. Every one of us have got to determine what's right and what's wrong for us. Now, if it's in the Bible, then there's no figuring it out. If the Word of God says, Thou shalt not lie, man created the word fib. Hello? It's men and women that say that's a white lie, that's a black lie. That's a good lie, that's a bad lie. God understands that kind of lie. This kind of lie is okay in certain circumstances. If you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, it's okay to lie to them. We figured out all kind of ways to make lying good, and yet the Bible still says that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. I guess that means all. Not sure what that means in the Greek, but I'm thinking all means all. All liars. Hello? We've got to understand that if the Bible says it, there's no wiggle room. What the Bible tells us to do and not do, we've got to obey. But what about when the Bible don't say it? Hello? Does the Bible specifically say, don't go to the club dancing? It's not in the book. But I promise you, if you've got the Holy Ghost... When you walk in such a place, you're going to feel conviction. And then you have the option of either responding to that conviction, doing a U-turn and walking out, or walk on in. Hello? Does the Bible specifically say... I ain't using that example. Stopped right in the middle of it. I was going to talk about something that's going to make you too mad. Let me just be general. Whatever you're doing, teach yourself to trust the Holy Ghost. Teach yourself to trust the Holy Ghost. If you're watching something that is not wholesome, now hold on. Here's an example I can use. Bible don't say don't watch your computer. It's amazing when the United Pentecost Church used to preach against TVs. Everybody went and got a computer. Watched the exact same movies as on TV. But by the letter of the law, they don't have a TV. They're watching it on a computer. It's going to make you mad. Going to make you old timers that live by the letter of the law going to make you really mad. Are you ready to get mad? There are going to be more people in hell over a computer than there ever will be over a television. Hello? Oh, Jesus. 
You know, I was telling you about be sensitive to the Holy Ghost and follow the Holy Ghost. What the Holy Ghost is telling me right now is get behind the pulpit before something's thrown at me. We got to come out of this, folks. We got to get out of this legalism. Do you say, Brother Cam, you think holiness is legalism? No. The Bible says holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's the only thing that God tells us to emulate Him in. Be ye holy as I am holy. God doesn't say be ye all powerful as I'm all powerful. He don't say be ye omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient as I am. He said, but in the area of holiness, I'm a holy God. God, I want my people to be a holy people. I'm not ever going to preach against holiness. I believe it stronger today than I've ever believed it in my lifetime. But you hear me when I tell you a bunch of rules, a bunch of do's, and a bunch of don'ts, and a list that's made up by man is not holiness. Holiness is when it gets in my heart. And whether the preacher preaches it or not, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I'm not acting that way. I'm not talking that way. I'm not giving myself to that habit because it grieves the Holy Ghost in me. Say amen, somebody. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. That has nothing to do with where you live. That has nothing to do with how young or old you are. Say, oh, well, you know, my mom lives that way, but, you know, God don't expect me to live that way. I know that was grandma's religion, but it's not my religion. Hello? Isn't it amazing today how many Bible editors... I never write a letter, a paper. I just wrote one 20-some pages long this week. I send it to Brother Rivera and Sister Mary Evans, our secretary, and I ask them to edit it. Edit it for content. Edit it for grammar. Edit it to make sure I've used the right words, the right punctuation. And they edit it and bring it back. And I promise you, they both find plenty of both in my letters and my papers that I write. But listen to me when I tell you, there is no time that God sends us his word with the directions, I want you to edit it. I want you to take out what you don't want. I want you to leave in what you like. I want you to change the wording to make it comfortable for you. Uh Uh-uh, honey. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but he said, my word shall not pass away. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. That old book said forever. Thy word is settled in heaven. Come on. Has nothing to do with generations. The word of God does not change generation to generation. I don't care what your professor's telling you. I don't care what the hireling at the preacher down the street's telling you. You know, if you don't appreciate nothing else about me, you ought to appreciate this. You don't ever go home scratching your head saying, wonder what that preacher thinks I ought to be doing. When we stand before God on judgment day, I'm the only person in this room that's going to give an account for every one of you. You're all going to give an account for yourself. But the Bible said in Hebrews chapter, what is it, 13 and 7, the scripture said to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? Because they're going to give an account. And that they might do it with joy and gladness and not with sorrow. Because if they got to do it with sorrow, that's, a, that, that's bad for you. Somebody needs to hear me today. You're not going to stand there on judgment day and point your bony finger at me and say, God, that preacher right there never told me. I'm telling you right now, there isn't anything in this world more important than pleasing God. There isn't anything this world's got to offer you that's worth going to hell over. There isn't anything this world's got for you that's worth compromising for. I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm looking you in the eye and telling you, when we all stand, 
stand before God someday and I've got to give an account. I'm not going to cower down in the corner and say, God, forgive me, I didn't tell him. I'm telling you now. Aunt Jane and Uncle John don't like it, preacher. Who are you serving, Aunt Jane and Uncle John or God? People I work with on the job make fun of me, preacher. I want you to know that if you're ashamed of Jesus, he said, I'll be ashamed of you. I got so much going through my mind I shouldn't say. But if you dress one way to come here, and when you think you're going to see one of us, and you dress another way where you think you're not going to be seen. That's hypocrisy. Oh, Lord Jesus. Are y'all okay? Anybody mad? We can open the altar early if you are. That book don't change. It don't matter where you live. It don't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your education level is. There was one old boy in the scripture that had went out and got himself all educated and so educated that he thought he was smarter than the word of God. And the apostle Paul looked at him and said, much learning hath made thee mad. You know what I've said to our young people for the last 20 years here is go get you a good education and then get over it. And anybody that tells you the word of God isn't true is lying. Anybody that tells you that you don't need to love God, they're telling you wrong. Anybody that tells you that the Bible's outdated, they're lying to you. Anybody that tells you that holiness and separation don't matter, they're lying to you. Anybody that tells you there is no plan of salvation, they're lying to you. I don't care how many degrees they got behind their name. I don't care what church they pastor, what radio station they're on, how many TV stations they're on, how many books they've written. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Say amen somebody. Whether you're educated or uneducated, whether you're rich or poor, put your seatbelt on. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, Preacher, I'm a Democrat, and you know us Democrats believe this. Preacher, I'm a Republican, and you know us Republicans believe this. I thought we were Christians first. Hello? I guess if Christian means Christ-like, then Democrat might mean Democrat-like. Republican might mean republican like people all the time say brother Kanem I hear you you get mad at both of them I get mad at all of them folks I get mad at all of them if you think any one of our political parties is growing wings and got a halo I got land to sell you in the glades in Florida hello you hear me today the only thing you can trust is God the only thing you can trust is the word of God the only thing you can trust is your relationship with God you better understand there is no group there is no culture there is no party there is no nothing that's going to get you to heaven except your relationship with God do not compromise your relationship with God for anything for anything. I had a guy tell me just a, it hadn't even been a week ago. He was trying to tell me how godly he is. And he said to me, he said, Preacher, you know how it is. I ain't like them city folk. I'm a country boy. You know us country boys were raised on the Bible. I said, son, I was raised in the country and did everything the devil wanted me to do and some things that embarrassed him. 
You are not automatically a Christian because you was raised in the city, not the country, or in the country, not the city. You're not, you're not automatically a Christian because you're Hispanic and not English, or English and not Hispanic. You're not automatically a Christian because you're Republican, not Democrat, or Democrat, not Republican. You are not automatically a Christian My God, I'm saying all kind of things ain't in my notes tonight. It don't make you a Christian because you're sitting inside Bible World Church tonight. <laughs> Going to church no more makes you a Chris Christian than walking into a garage makes you a car. Hello? If you're going to be a Christian, it's going to be because something gets a hold of you and you say in your mind and heart, I'm not going to love the world. I'm not going to love the things that are in the world. I understand that if I love the world, the love of the Father's not in me. And I refuse to do that. You're going to be a Christian. It's going to be because you determined, I'm going to come out from among them and be separate. I'm not going to touch the unclean thing. I want to be received by God. That's what Christianity is based on. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Come on, folks. Y'all still with me? A strict adherence to those two verses I've quoted a half a dozen times in this message are why Christians, people who desire to be Christ-like, why Christians always have and still do make the choice not to look like the world, not to talk like the world, not to go to worldly places, not to be bound by worldly habits, not to love the world, not to think like the world, not to be entangled with the world. Those decisions are made by adhering to Love not the world. By adhering to, come ye out from among them, be ye separate. That when you make your mind up, you're going to do that. Guess what? It's a sin. If God tells you to stop and buy a piece of bubble gum and you don't do it. And I promise you, that isn't going to be on the list I make for you. Hello? When that guy cuts you off in traffic, And you have a few choice words for him that nobody but your precious wife and kids get to hear. That ain't going to be on my list. Those kind of things are only dealt with by you determining I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to please God. I'm going to try to make sure that every part of my life pleases him. Can somebody say amen? amen. Say amen again. Amen. We don't get our marching orders from 2023. We don't get our marching orders from the world. We don't get our marching orders from the colleges. Surely I hope we don't get our marching orders from the television. From Hollywood. I hope we don't get our marching orders from every spirit that runs to and fro in this earth. We have got to, in the, in the understanding that Jesus is coming again, we've got to get serious about living for God. We've got to get serious about pleasing Him. We've got to get serious about doing what He wants us to do. I'm not trying to be ugly. But we ought to do what he wants us to do and then quit caring what everybody else is trying to get you to do. Amen. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. A Christian, one who desires to be Christ-like, doesn't have a problem with 1 Timothy 2 and 9. Also, I desire that women should adorn themselves modestly and appropriately and sensibly in seemly apparel. Yes, 
Christians who desire to be Christ-like don't have a problem with Deuteronomy 22 and 5. A woman shall not, not might, maybe could be under certain circumstances. A woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Quietest it's been at Bible World all day long. Oh, Brother Cunningham, I just don't believe the Bible means that in 2023. That is exactly what the devil wants you to believe. You are believing exactly the way he wants you to believe, that God doesn't mean what he says. Isn't that the first lie that the devil ever told to humanity and we're still falling for it? He tells Eve in the garden, said, look, eat of that tree. Eve said, oh, no, 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 no. God said, in the day that you eat of that tree, you're surely going to die. And the devil said, God don't mean what he said. Guess what? He had never had to find a new trick. That old one still works. I'm here to tell you tonight that if God said it, it means exactly what God said. Amen. A Christian, one who desires to be Christ-like, refuses to talk like the world talks. Ephesians 4 and 29 said, Let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth. Christian don't have no problem with Luke 6 and 45. Jesus said, A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. But an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Hello? A Christian don't have a problem with that. Say, oh, preacher, you're trying to tell me cussing's wrong? Yeah, I'm trying to tell you cussing's wrong. Trying to tell me that foul language is bad? Yeah, I'm trying to tell you foul language is bad. You trying to tell me I can't tell a dirty joke with the guys at the shipyard or on the job? Yeah, I'm telling you, you can't do that. Not if you want to please God. Hello? No matter what the world does for fun, no matter what the world calls entertainment, if it isn't godly, a real Christian won't do it. Hello? I'm talking about a Christian who desires to be Christ-like. A Christian who desires to be Christ-like is not going to go places and do things that they know dishonors God. Y'all okay? Y'all want me to quit? A Christian, one who desires to be Christ-like, is going to refuse worldly habits. There's a scary scripture in the Bible in Romans chapter 6 that I want to point out to you. Romans 6, 16 to 18, if you got your Bibles, I know it's on the screen, but this is one you ought to mark. Romans 6, 16 to 18, it said, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. You've got to see the contrast here. He said, whoever you give yourself to, whatever habit, you let have control of your life. Drugs, 
alcohol, music, videos, pornography. Whatever you yield yourself to, get this with me. The scripture says you become a servant to that thing you yield yourself to. Now when you come to God, you were set free. When you come to God, he said, you become a servant free from sin and servants of righteousness. That's what happened to you when you come to God. But if you're not careful, if you don't draw real lines, Oh, preacher, would you draw the lines for me? No, I'm not going to. You've got to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling before God. You've got to know what pleases God in your life. You've got to know what God's convicting you of yourself. Otherwise, you're just doing it because the pastor asked. And you don't get a bunch of credit for that. It's not Christianity when you just follow a bunch of rules. How many of you think your marriage would last if your wife and you sit down after church tonight and you said to your wife, I want you to write down everything you want me to do and not do. You get one shot at it, sis. Write it down. Whatever's on your mind, write it down. And then I'm going to write down everything I want you to do. And I'll carry mine in my pocket and you carry yours in your pocket and we'll read them every day and we'll go by this list and try to build a loving marriage. Ain't going to work. I said it ain't going to work. I can't make a list for you that when you've done A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, you can grin from ear to ear and say, I did everything the preacher said to do. I know I'm doing a whole bunch of things that displease God, but I've done everything the preacher said. We've got to come to the place before Jesus comes that, Brother Troy, I want to please God. I want to know Him. I want to be right before Him. I want to have a right relationship with Him. Somebody clap your hands and say yes. Here's the problem. Matthew 6 and 24, if you got your Bibles, turn there. Jesus said, no man, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon arguably can mean money. It also means the worldly system. You can't serve God and the world. You can't do it. Either you're going to love one and hate the other, or you're going to hate the one and love the other. But you can't do both. He went on to say sweet and bitter water don't come out of the same fountain. Figs don't bear olive Olives, it, it's, it's either you're going to be one or you're going to be the other. Hello? He said, I would you were, and this verse needs a whole Bible study on one verse. I would that you were either hot or cold. Now whether you like it or not, God is actually saying here, I'd rather you be cold. He said, I would that you would either be hot or cold, because if you're in the middle, if you're lukewarm, the great God of heaven said, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. Hello? I, it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. God saying, I'd rather you be cold than to be lukewarm. Whew. Hello? You say, oh, preacher, I'm, I'm, I'm not where I want to be, but I got a great desire. That isn't what this verse is talking about. It's talking about the one that is deliberately living in the middle and trying to live both lives, both worlds at the same time. And God's saying either get on one side or the other. I don't want you trying to be the hypocrite in the middle. Hello? I don't want you to be the one that's in the middle trying to live two lives 
trying to please everybody on both sides of the, of the fence. I don't want you in that position where you don't hardly, can't hardly keep up with who you are and where you are and who you're with and what you're supposed to be doing. I don't want that for you. Say amen. amen. A Christian, one who desires to be Christ-like, has fixed his or her attention not on this world, but on the world to come. If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. If you're thinking this is it, you've got to be a miserable person. If you're thinking this is as good as it's ever going to get, you must be a miserable person. But honey, if you can get your mind fixed on heaven, a street of gold, a wall of jasper, a gate of pearl, 12 foundations, 1,500 miles square, and the city hath no need of a light because Jesus will be there and he is the light of that city. It's a city where we're never going to grow old, where there's no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no sickness, no more death. Honey, you can stay here if you want to. You can hope Joe Biden or Donald Trump gets us out of this mess if you're dumb enough to do that. Hello? You can pray that they split Congress and the Senate half and half. Half Democrats, half Republicans. If you're a Republican, I'll let you have one more of those. If you're a Democrat, I'll let you have one more of those. We can do it any way you want to do it. And one year from now, I guarantee you, we're going to be in a worse mess than we're in today in this world. But if your hope is not in this world, if your hope is not in worldly systems, if your hope is not in the powers that be in this world, but your hope is in God... Say amen. amen. James chapter 4 and verse 4 says this. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. It is the enemy of God. Works against God. Contrary to God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of of the world is the enemy of God. Say amen. amen. I'm going to end with a new separation thought that is uniquely 2023 separation. I told you there were things the old timers preached about for and against that are not even relevant in our day. There's things that are very relevant in our day that our forefathers died, went to be with the Lord without ever seeing. And those things have to be dealt with in every single generation. Let me talk about some of them. In 2023, we're witnessing a war of thought. In 2023, the battlefield is your mind. So Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, Think on these things. Our own minds can become our own worst enemy. We can think ourselves into a corner. We can think ourselves into a position of defeat. We can think ourselves into a position of worldliness. There's an old scripture in the Bible. There's an old thought in the Bible. My grandfather used to interpret it like this. He'd say, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you don't have to let him land on your head and build a nest there. What did he mean by that, preacher? He was talking about what you think. You can't stop some thoughts from swinging through, 
but you don't have to reach out and grab it and pull it back and build a whole story around it. Because what you're going to do is you're going to destroy yourself from the inside out. I heard one of my favorite African-American preachers preaching, and I'm telling you, that guy can preach better accidentally than most men can on purpose. You ain't ever heard such preaching. And he's up preaching one day, and he made the statement. He said, sin don't begin in the bed. Sin begins in the head. Hello? You need to be careful what you think. You need to be careful what you let come into your mind. I promise you nobody's ever told anybody off with their mouth that they didn't tell them off in their mind a half a dozen times before that. Nobody's ever cussed anybody that they didn't cuss them in their mind before it ever come out their mouth. Nobody's ever balled up a fist and hit somebody. Nobody's ever stole anything. Nobody's ever pulled the trigger of a gun. Nobody's ever done anything bad to anybody else that it didn't happen up here first. And in 2023, the most dangerous battlefield, the reason is, is we've got so many devices that feed the mind. The most dangerous of all of our battlefields is right up here. Hello? Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 2. The Apostle Paul writes, Be not conformed to this world. Y'all know what that means? Don't let the world put you in a box. Don't let it make something out of you that it wants. Don't let it make you look, act, talk, and think like it wants. Don't be conformed to this world. It goes on. But be ye transformed. Oh, that's what I want right there, preacher. I don't want to look like the world, talk like the world, act like the world, think like the world, go where the world goes, run with worldly people. I don't want to do none of that conforming stuff. Transform. That's what I want, preacher. But be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Hold on. If sin begins here, if murder begins here, if adultery begins here, if lying begins here, if cussing begins here, guess what? Salvation can begin here. Victory can begin here. Power over the enemy can begin here. When you start thinking right. Say amen. amen. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. It said, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Stand with me, I'm closing. We are fighting unique battles in 2023. While we are fighting the good fight of faith, while we are taking a stand for morality, taking a stand for truth and righteousness in the Word of God, let us also take a stand for being a Christian in our community and in our world. I leave Tuesday morning, I'll leave the house at 4 o'clock, heading for Bangkok, Thailand. I go from Bangkok, Thailand to Cambodia. While I'm in Thailand, it is 96.5% Buddhist. It's 3% Muslim. And a half a percent in the whole nation is Christian. I will be surrounded by Buddhist people, Muslim people. It will be my 38th year going to Thailand. I've spent a lot of time there. Can I tell you, It is the will of God. Don't want to say this wrong. It is the will of God that in a nation that is 96.5%, and I, I'm trying to figure out how to say it and not be ugly, I am sure that a large part of the mayhem, the murder, the pain, the suffering, the tyranny, that's going on in our world 
is at the hands of people that hate America, hate what America and the West stands for. And it would be very easy for me to carry that hatred into that nation because I'm an American. I'm a red-blooded American. But I'm telling you, it would be better for me not to go to that nation if I'm not going to be a Christian while I'm there. Hello? The suit I've got on, the shirt I've got on, made by Muslim tailors that have made my clothes for all 38 years I've gone to Thailand. Muslim tailors. They love me to death. All you guys that have been there with me, they treat me like family. The boys that run it now, I say boys, they're about 40 years old. When I first bought suits there, I bought from their grandpa. Then I bought from their dad. Their, di their dad died with colon cancer, and those two boys called me, called me. Would you come and bury our dad? Would you come and do the service for our dad? Would you come and meet with our family and pray with our family? And there's only one reason they do that is because for 38 years I've acted like I'm a Christian there, not an American that don't like Muslims. Hello? Now there's one my grandpa never had to figure out. We're living in a different day. We're living in a different world. And our world is forcing everybody to take sides. I love the black members of our church, but you be very careful that other black people aren't forcing you to take a side that makes you hate white people. I love our white people, but you be very careful that your upbringing don't make you hate black people. And if either one of you falls in that trap, you will be lost. It's more important to be Christian than it is to be white. It's more important to be Christian than it is to be American. It's more important to be a Christian than it is to be from the United States and the state of Virginia. It's more important to be a Christian than it is to be black. Or it is to speak Spanish. Or to speak English. We're living in a day that every little old difference... We're all getting together with people in our difference and we're huddling up and we're becoming a group that hates everybody else. There's nothing Christian about that. If you're in this church and you don't like black people, go find you another church. If you're in this church and you don't like white people, go find you another church. If you're in this church and you don't like our Spanish-speaking people, go find you another church. I'm telling you the truth tonight. If we're going to be Christians, it's either going to affect every area of our life or we are not Christians. I had a pastor tell me, I nearly split my church. During the last elections, he said, we're about half Democrat, half pub Republican, and oh, did we get in a church fight. I promise you, me or you want to leave if it ever gets like that because there's nothing Christian about that. One of the hardest verses of Scripture for Americans to wrap their brain around is when Paul said, there's no more Jew, no more Greek, no more bond, no more free. And here's where us Americans have problems with it. No more male, no more female in the body of Christ. Honey, when you walk through that door, we're all part of the same body. We're all baptized in the same name. We're all covered with the same blood. We're all filled with the same spirit. Yes, yes, yes. 
You're not going to like it when I'm done with this. But I got news for you. God don't have a white church. So I go to a white church. God ain't got no such thing. Oh, well, I go down to the black church. God ain't got no such thing. God's got a church. And it's supposed to be open for whosoever will. Let them come. Now, my grandpa never preached the last three minutes I've been preaching once in his whole life. That's what I mean by 2023 separation. You can either act like the rest of the world, join your little gang, and hate everybody else, or you can come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Hello? Let me tell you the kind of fights we're having today. We're fighting with civility over bigotry. Grandpa never had to deal with that. We're dealing with unbiased behavior over prejudice. We're dealing with faith over unbelief. Inclusion over exclusion. Godliness over worldliness. Morality over carnality. Love over hatred. Kindness over cruelty. Trust over skepticism. Truth over man's opinion. Purity over sinfulness. Appreciation over apathy. Selflessness over selfishness. You know, it's one of the signs of the times. Quit worrying about who's going to be the Antichrist. I told a group the other day, I got so fussed up with them about a week ago. I think maybe Brother Rivera was there. I'm not sure. I got so fussed up, these people. Who's going to be the Antichrist? Where's the Battle of Armageddon going to be? What are they going to do at the Battle of Armageddon? What countries are going to be at Armageddon? When are they going to give out the mark of the beast? I said, hold on a minute, Igmo. We ain't going to be here for none of that. You're never going to see the Antichrist. You're not going to be here for the Battle of Armageddon. You're never going to have to take the mark of the beast. The Antichrist can't even be revealed, the Bible said, until you're gone. I only said Igmo because, you know, there's that other word that starts with S-T-U and ends with P-I-D that I'm not allowed to say. Here's a scripture of prophetic value we ought to be paying attention to. Men shall be lovers of them own selves. Selfishness. Selfishness. We're dealing with selfishness today at a level we've never dealt before in the history of the world. Hello? 90 plus percent. Now this is going to make folks not want to come in to see me. I've got to be careful about this. But 90 plus percent of everything everybody tells me has its roots in selfishness. You don't steal something that belongs to somebody else unless you're selfish. You don't lie to somebody and mislead them or deceive them unless you're selfish. You think more of yourself than you do them. You don't fool with a best friend's wife unless you're selfish. Hello? Every sin that's brought into me with tears, I promise you, 90 plus percent of them, I can trace them back to selfishness. Now that is a sign of the time that the church ought to pay attention to. Hello? We ought to pay attention to the verses that says in the last days, men will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What's that mean, preacher? It means they're going to go find somebody who will say it like they want to hear it. That's a sign of the time. Hello? I'm trying to tell somebody here tonight that we've got to make our minds up. This is a different day. We're dealing with different devils. We're dealing with different temptations. We're living in a world that no longer considers sexual sin, sin. 
You know what they're calling it among young people? Friends with benefits. Don't like each other. Don't want nothing permanent with you. Let's just have sex together. Hello? Living in a day whenever people will lie to you, look you square in the eye and never blink. Because they have no conviction about lying anymore. People are hateful and ugly. People will be deceiving. They'll cheat you. And they don't care. And you and I, for the first time in history, have to decide whether or not we're going to be like the world. Oh, preacher, when I heard you announce it today, I thought for sure this was going to be a don't drink, don't smoke, don't take drugs, don't listen to rock music, don't cut my hair, don't dresses to your knees, elbows, necklines. No, you know all that stuff. You don't need me to get you together and repeat stuff you already know. What I'm telling you is that we're fighting with devils today we've never ever fought with before. And if we're going to be Christians, it's going to require us to step up. It's going to require us to get closer to God than we've ever been before. Somebody said amen. amen. I close with this. Colossians 3, 8 and 9. It's on the screen. But now put away and rid yourselves completely of all these things. You ready? Anger, rage, bad feeling toward others, curses and slander and foul-mouthed abuse and shameful utterances from your lips. Do not lie one to another for you have stripped off the old, ungenerated, unregenerated self with its evil practices. But now put away and rid yourselves completely. Let's bow our heads together. Father, every now and then, it's important that we have straight talk. Every now and then, Lord God, it's important that I, as the shepherd of the church, help the church understand where the fence line is, where we need to go and not go, do and not do. Some way, God, we've got to be made aware of the wolves in sheep's clothing, the pitfalls, all of those things that are designed to destroy the sheep and the flock. Every now and then, Lord God, we've got to come together and we've got to say what's not easy to say and hear what's not easy to hear. But it's got to be done. It's in your word. God, you didn't call us to preach a fluffy gospel. You didn't call us to just make it so sweet and so easy and so nice that we would never be challenged to do better or to get closer to you. But no, Lord, you're bidding us to come close. You're bidding us in 2023 to come up higher. You're bidding us, oh God, to separate ourselves from the world. Not to be like the world, act like the world, or talk like the world. You're bidding us, oh God, to be more like you. And God, I'm absolutely convinced that you've got a house full of people here that love you with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. I am convinced that these folks are faithful to the house of God because they want to know you. They want to please you. They want to live for you. They want to be a light for you. I pray, God, you'd give them the righteous desires of their heart. I pray, Lord God, that you would move among them in a new way, in a better way, a greater way than they've ever known you before. I pray, oh God, for blessings. I pray that you would open the windows of heaven and pour them out blessing they don't have room enough to receive. I pray, Lord God, that you'd put it in every one of our hearts to draw near to you. I pray, oh God, for your people as we attempt to separate ourselves from the world. Help us with that. I ask all of this in the name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. 
I love you folks. If my wife was up here, every time I call on her, I know what she's going to say. She's going to stand here and start crying. Say, I want you all to go to heaven. And I can tell you we live our lives for that reason. How many people can we take to heaven with us? That's, what it's, that's why I'm getting on a plane going to fly 32 hours. When you leave New York City, you're 10,000 miles to Bangkok. Whether you go east or west, it is all the way around the world. But I do it because I want to see how many people I can take to heaven with me. I don't want to go to Thailand and preach and lose what we got here. I don't want people under my own nose to be lost and me not know it. Needing to get closer to God and me not be aware of it. I want us to make heaven. Does everybody understand that? It's all it's about. It's all it's about is I want us to make heaven. Would you shake hands with about a dozen people if you can? If you don't shake hands, at least wave at them and smile real big. Let them know you love them. Thank you for letting me do Wednesday night Bible study on Sunday night. I love y'all. Pray for me while I'm in Thailand. Hold on just a minute. Sorry. I pulled the trigger too soon. Brother Troy's got something he wants to tell you. Just a few announcements I want to bring you before we all dismiss here. Call to war prayer tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Of course, our end time series is continuing. So every Wednesday night, we're having a different theme or a different topic for the end time series. Now, I want if the AV booth, can you put the youth fundraiser slide on the screen here for us? So Wednesday will be our last day for us to get the pre-order for the youth fundraiser for the Valentine's charcuterie boxes that they're putting together for us. There's a $40 box and there's a $20 box. And of course, this money goes, of course, to our young people. It goes to help fund other things uh, in the church for them. So please support this. Even if you have no interest in taking part of the charcuterie box, take it, give it, gift it to somebody else. And for all of our husbands and men in the house, obviously we got Valentine's sneaking up on us, so don't let it take you unawares. Praise God. There are other Valentine's Valentine's meetings that are taking place in the church. Please take part in those as you see them. And then uh, we have our youth weekend that's coming up on February 19th with Daniel Jones. It's going to be a great, great time. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer one more time in dismissal. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We magnify your holy name. Thank you, Lord God, for the message that we heard tonight on separation. God, let us be, Lord God, the separated church that we need to be in this world to love and to reach out for the lost. In Jesus' precious name, we love you. Praise God, sister. Ladies, don't forget our meeting this Saturday. I want all the ladies here. It's the only meeting we're having for the planning of the rest of the year. So it's going to be this Saturday, ladies. Don't forget. I love you, ladies. I love you, men, too. <laughs> Lord bless you. Thank you. Praise God. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.